we are here and uh, everyone in internet land is is with us I guess so tonight we are going through chapter 32 of Deuteronomy it's a very famous section of Deuteronomy it's called the Song of Moses uh, and this is going to be part one next week we'll take the other half of it because there's really too much in it to possibly cover in one week the song of moses is really a concise theology god made for israel and i think you'll see how many elements that are theologically important that are in it there are a couple things in it and we'll talk about those verses that if it weren't for the Song of Moses, we might not understand them very well at all. In other words, they're revealed here in the Song of Moses uh, that, well, they're, they're more revealed, more clearly revealed somewhat in the New Testament, but still uh, they're unique in terms of the understanding. And we'll, there's two areas that we'll talk about in that. So basically this song or song whichever you want to say it's really a poem and a song it's a poem that god gave moses but it was apparently put to music and they sang it of course we don't know what music it was put to all right uh we just simply know the content of the the poem or the song itself now the basic image of this song of this poem is of a father dealing with a blessed but rebellious son and that is the image all the way through it and of course uh, this is uh i think an image of what in the new testament uh is the story of the prodigal mm -hmm. okay uh it, i think it really comes from and, and i can't prove it but i think it's very possible that this was in the mind of christ when he then told the story of the or the parable of the prodigal son now the point is that God makes it clear all the things historically he's done for Israel and he goes through all kinds of them and his point is that because of that they have the moral obligation to appreciate and to obey him but of course they don't and that becomes the source of a lot of the content here now you'll notice let's read the first uh back here let's read the first eight verses here of Deuteronomy 32 he says give ear O heavens and let me speak let the earth hear the words of my mouth let my teaching drop uh, as the rain and my speech distill as the dew as the droplets on the fresh grass and as the showers on the herb for I proclaim the name of the Lord, ascribe greatness to our God. The rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are just. A God of faithfulness and without injustice, righteousness and upright is he. They have acted corruptly towards him. They have they have not his children, they are not his children because of their their defect, but are a perverse and crooked generation. Do, do you thus repay the Lord, O foolish and unwise people? Is not he your father who has, who has bought you? He has made you and established you. Remember the days of old, consider the years of all generations. Ask your father and he will inform you, your elders, and they will tell you. When the Most High gave the, inher the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of men, and he set the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the sons of Israel. All right, so let's tear this apart a little bit and see what's in here. Now, he says that the Lord will appeal to the heavens and to the earth as witness of what he's done and what he will do also in the future. Because this is going to talk about the fact because they will disobey then he will discipline them and it's going to talk about how he's going to do it the heavens that he refers to are not 
the heavenly sphere of angels and God himself, that's not the heavens he's referring to. He's literally referring to the two, the two distinct parts of the creation, that is the atmosphere of the sky with the planets and the stars and everything in them, and also the physical earth, that is the two basic elements of what he himself created. Now, he says that they are used as a witness to, and they'll see that Israel will be punished for their disobedience. He will repeatedly use, quote, the nations to discipline Israel. Again, goyim. Goyim means anyone who's not a Jew. Everyone who is not a Jew falls in the category of non-Jew or goyim. Is it the same as Gentile? All Gentiles are, in Hebrew, goyim, correct, okay? Now, contrast, interestingly, this usage where he talks about the use of the heavens and the earth to punish Israel to a future punishment where God will actually use the heavens and the earth to punish them. He uses the nations to punish them in what we're talking about here. But in the future, he's going to use the earth to punish the nations. In the book of Revelation, when you start to go through all the different scrolls that are unrolled, so many of them are earthquakes and pestilence and all these things, things that come down from heaven, all these things that he's using the earth to punish the nations. Why? Because they have allied themselves to a false king. His name is Antichrist, and he punishes the nations eventually because they are allied to Antichrist and do not acknowledge him. Now, in verse 2, the poem begins with a, let's call it, mild hope that maybe they will be wise, maybe they will listen to the Lord's counsel, but eventually, of course, we find this is a fleeting hope and that they do not listen to the Lord's counsel at all, and therefore they're going to go through discipline. Now, really, this is it's called the Song of Moses, but really, it's not. It's the Song of God to Moses, yeah. is what it really is, okay? Because it's, it's literally dictated by God to Moses, who then writes it down and who then teaches it to Israel. That, that's the way it works. Okay, now, we see here, and I think if we look to verse, um, verses 3 and 4, especially, we see some interesting things. We see that it talks about the characteristics of God's greatness. First of all, it declares him as the rock. Interestingly, and I do not think coincidentally, this term, the rock, is used seven times in this poem. What do we know about seven? Perfect. Exactly, the number of perfect or spiritual completion, and it's used seven times. If you want to know, it's found in verses 4, 13, 15, 18, 30, 31, and 37. Each one of those refers to the rock. And of course, not only is it an image of God, okay? But of course, we also know, which I'll talk about just in a second, it's also an image of Messiah, okay? We'll talk about that in a second. Now, the word here for rock is an interesting word. It's the word to sir in the Hebrew. It does not mean a pebble. It does not mean a small stone. It does not even mean a large boulder. Literally, the word to sir means a large prominent cliff overlooking a territory, quote unquote, a high place. That's what the word means. Now, it's an image of God creating the earth, which projects out or overlooks or is overlooked by the heavens. I think it's also interesting that if you turn you keep your finger, turn over a couple pages to the last chapter of Deuteronomy 34, and look what God says to Moses. 
he says, so Moses went up to the plains of Moab, to Mount Nebo, to the top of Pisgah. Apparently Nebo is a prominent outrock or prominent peak in this chain of Mount Pisgah. Near the two peaks. Yes. And of course, then he says, and the Lord showed him, now notice, notice this, and the Lord showed him all the land, Gilead as far as Dan, and all of Naphtali, and the land of Ephraim and of Manasseh, and all the land of Judah as far as the Western Sea, and the Negev, and the plain in the Valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees as far as Zor. If you look at those places on a map, he takes him on a panoramic tour all around from Nebo. Okay? And I think that's exactly the image of him being the rock. Literally, Moses literally goes on the rock, gets up on the rock, and that's where he dies. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? Now, <clears throat> we see this term, the rock. Of course, it implies that God is the foundation of all things. He is the foundation of existence. He is the immovable one of the entire universe. Um, Jesus, of course, makes an interesting statement. If you want to turn to Matthew 21 here for a second. Matthew chapter 21. There are many images of this. I'm just picking this one. It's verse 42 of Matthew 21. Jesus said to them, did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? This became the chief cornerstone. This came about from the Lord, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Now, that, of course, is a quote from Psalm 118. There are many Old Testament quotes about the Messiah also being the rock, and of course, there are many more New Testament quotes about it. Another New Testament verse that we've read before is 1 Corinthians 10, 4, where he's also called the rock that they followed through the wilderness. Uh, and of course, Christ. Now, <clears throat> it's also interesting that the first name of God used in Genesis is El Shaddai. Okay? El Shaddai means a mountain or a high place. That's its literal meaning. So he's going back to this basic information. Of course, we also see that this image of the rock is very prophetic. Turn, if you would, back, if you're in Matthew, back to the Old Testament, to Daniel, chapter two. Daniel chapter two. And what you look at verse 45. This is this prophecy about these kingdoms, okay? And he says in Daniel 2:45, inasmuch as you saw that a stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and it and it crushed the iron and the bronze, the clay and the silver and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will take place in the future. So the dream is true and its interpretation is trustworthy. In other words, at the end of all of these different uh, cultures and these great kingdoms, finally comes this mountain, the rock. Okay, again, another prophetic image here. Also, we see an interesting image, I think, in, uh, you don't have to turn here, but I'm gonna go to Revelation chapter eight. Let's see if I wrote this down correctly. Okay. Come on, where are you? Um, verses 8 and 9. Listen to what it says. And the second angel sounded, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea. And a third of the sea became blood, and a third of the creatures uh, which were in the sea and had life died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. Now, 
it's a great mountain. It could not, you could not have a great mountain, quote unquote, that fell into the sea of a large size because if it did, it would absolutely annihilate the earth. It doesn't take actually a thing of great size coming at the speed that it would come at descending through the Earth's uh, atmosphere to create an unbelievable level of energy that would be equivalent with probably all the atom bombs capable on the Earth of exploding at the same time. I mean, even something a mile by a mile would just annihilate the surface of the Earth. So it can't really mean that. I think it's another image of God in his judgment coming to Earth. A great mountain comes to the earth. Okay? The sea is often used to describe the nations. Even in the book of Revelation, it's used many times. So I think it's another image here. Now, notice in verse 4, back to our chapter, Deuteronomy 32, in verse 4, And in verse 5, it says, uh, For all his ways are just, and a God of faithfulness without injustice. Righteous and upright is he. Okay, now, so basically what he's saying is, there are four essential attributes of God. They are perfection, justice, faithfulness, and righteousness. Those are the four he talks about. This will be the way in which God will deal both with Israel and ultimately also with the nations. He will use these characteristics. These characteristics are the basis of true moral absolutes in the universe. The only way that you can have a moral absolute is for a being to have that capacity and demonstrate that capacity. And this is the character of God. So from the character of God, we derive all morality. The Ten Commandments are derived from the character of God. All these things are derived from the character of God. And of course, the point being in this, the implication, is that because of these four major characteristics of God, no one has any right to change them. Okay? They are his attributes that should be unchangeable. No one should mess with them. But what are we seeing right now in the world and especially in our culture? They're trying to redefine all morality, change everything that was originally a creation and an attribute of God and pervert it into something different. Now, God is very angry at Israel for doing this. Let me assure you, he's going to be no less angry with any nation that does this. He does not tolerate this level of perversion. Now, in verses 5 and 6, we see here that they've acted corruptly towards God, and things begin to heat up. That is, the tone becomes more a tone of anger, of the father who has nurtured and blessed his son, who now uh, shows uh, and his son behaves in, a, in an unrighteous and unthankful way and perverts all of the things that God has blessed him with and given to him. It reminds me very much, I'm going to turn here, you don't have to, but I'm going to turn to Romans 1. Yeah. It reminds me in principle of Romans 1, and I can't help but wonder if Paul did not have this concept in mind here in Deuteronomy when he wrote this. And he, look what he says. Think of the parallels here between what we're reading and Romans 1, starting verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Why? Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. And then he goes to, remember, he talks about the earth and the sky. He says, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, divine nature, have been clearly seen. Clearly seen. 
okay? And it says, uh, being understood by that which has been made so that they are, quote, without excuse. And it says, for even though they knew God, that is, they knew of God, they knew about God, they didn't honor him as God. And again, what's the point? Or give thanks. In other words, the creation was made for them. God made them also but in, and made all the things for them to live. But despite that fact, they showed no thankfulness for God for all of this. And he says, what's, what happens because they're unthankful? It says, uh, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was dark and professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And what did it lead to? Verse 23, and they exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds, four-footed animals, and crawling creatures. Idolatry. And that's exactly what we're going to be talking about in a few verses. What happens after they turn the Israel turns away from God, they quickly turn to idolatry. Okay, so I think it's very likely Paul had this concept in mind as he taught in Romans chapter one. Now in verse seven, he asked them to begin by considering their own history. He says, talk to your older relatives, talk to your elders, you know, and ask them what the Lord accomplished. What did he do in Egypt? What did he accomplish through the Exodus? How did he lead in the wilderness? What was the manna that he provided in the water? Uh, but of course, despite all this very clear history, which is repeated over and over again by God, okay, they disregarded all of it. Now, in verse 8, there's a very unique verse here that I want to spend some time on because uh, it is a verse that gives us information that otherwise might be difficult to understand. And it's the first place in which it's said. Let's read the verse again, and then I'll explain it. When the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of men and set the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the sons of Israel. Mm -hmm. All right, now, let's take this apart. Most Bibles that we have that are translated are translated from a 10th century Hebrew scroll that's called the Masoretic Text. The Masoretes were scribes, and they made accurate, you know, quote unquote, documents. And of course, most of all the Bibles that you're going to that are in different languages are taken from this original Masoretic text. The problem is, it's one of the oldest Hebrew texts we have. We have a much, much uh, younger text that was occurred in about 300. BC, about a thousand years before the Masoretic text, called the Septuagint, the Greek version of the Old Testament. It's far older than the Masoretic text. Now, it's interesting that in this, both in the Septuagint version of the Old Testament and in places where the Dead Sea Scrolls quote this area, the text says, Li Mispar Bene Elohim. In other words, translation, according to the sons of God, literally according to the angels. That's literally what it says in the Hebrew. So the nations that were created and dispersed as mentioned in Genesis chapter 10, that's the chapter of, the, of, the, of the, what's called the table of the nations. The boundaries of each apparently were according to the number of the angels that God put over each one of these nations. And the boundaries were set up this way. So there are 70, quote, sons of Elohim who supervised the nations. Now I want you to notice a couple of things. Hold your place here. And go to Job chapter 1. Job has often some very interesting information in it. 
Okay, come on. Ah, I'm skipping. Where are you, Joe? After asking. Come on. I tell you what, do me a favor, because I'm my fingers are bumbling here. Would you read uh, the first few verses, one of you, of, especially Job 1 6? Read Job 1 6. Anyone? There was a man in the land of, or, or was it Uz? Uz. Uz, okay. Yeah. Whose name was Job. And that man was blameless, upright, fearing God, and turning away from evil. Seven sons and three daughters were born to him. His possessions also were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and very many servants. And that man was the greatest of all the men of East. Okay. Verse 6. six. Okay. Now <clears throat> there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves to before God and Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, from roaming around on the earth and walking around on it. The Lord said to Satan, have you ever considered my servant Job? Good. Okay. Now, notice the significance of what happens here. This day occurs. We don't know what day it is, but there are, there's this, what we call, what we've termed the divine council. That is the 70 angelic beings that God has appointed over the 70 nations. Okay. And there's a time where the divine council meets. Mm -hmm. And another Elohim, little e, shows up. His okay. name is Satan. Satan because he's a fallen Elohim. And we, we notice here that, that he, uh the, the, satan has been watching the earth or watching the nations now it's interesting you see another reference to this you don't have to turn here but in psalm 97 verses 7 and verse 9 you talk about the sons of god which it says here in the psalm were associated with the idols but these sons of god associated with the idols are not god's divine counsel but rather they're a counterfeit counsel, all right? That is Satan's divine counsel. Satan, remember, always does things in a mirror image way. What God does, he copies, but in a mirror image sense. He's not very creative. He's always following a pattern of God and corrupting it. Now, <clears throat> notice also something. I'm going to turn here. I think often is missed. I'm going to go to Exodus chapter 15. It's easy to go over this verse, and yet it's a really important verse. Mm -hmm. Exodus 15, and I'm going to read verse 11. It says, Who is like thee among the gods, O Lord? Who is like thee, majestic in holiness, awesome in praises, and working wonders? What's he talking about there? Who is like God? That is, are the B'nai Elohim, the angelic beings, like God? Obviously, the answer to this question, it's a rhetorical question, is no. God is unique among all of the spiritual beings, the Elohim. He is the capital E Elohim. All right, we talked about this when we did our, our section on the, the spiritual uh, realm. We talked about all of these beings are called Elohim, okay? There, but there's only one, we'll call it capital E Elohim, the creator God. So he's unique above all of the B'nai Elohim, the sons of God, that is the angelic beings. Now it's interesting if you go to Genesis chapter 10, which I did, you this is called, we often call it the Table of Nations. And it talks about Japheth had so many offspring, and then Shem had so many offspring, and then Ham had so many offspring. And it talks about each one of them then. 
what you find is Japheth had 14 different offspring from him that became 14 different nations. Shem had 26 of his group that became nations, and Ham had 30. So you add 14, 26, and 30, and you get 70. 70. And that's how we know there were 70 original nations as defined by God. Okay? So God appoints originally an angelic being to be to be over each one of these nations but of course when satan rebels he creates his own counterfeit divine counsel mm -hmm. that opposed god's divine counsel now how do we know that well turn if you would let's remind ourselves turn if you would to daniel 10. this is such an interesting part of the bible because it pulls back the curtain on things and tells us information that otherwise we would never know now in daniel 10 and let me read let's start in uh, let's let me start in about um, let me start in verse 10. then behold a hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees and he said to me, O oh, Daniel, man of high esteem, understand the words that I'm about to tell you and stand upright, for I have now been sent to you. And when he had spoken this word to me, I stood up trembling. And he said to me, do, now remember, Daniel has prayed for an answer to this prophetic image, for, uh, an, an answer to what's gonna happen in the future for 21 consecutive days. And he hasn't gotten an answer. All right, this is now the 21st day. Verse 12, then he said to me, do not be afraid, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart on understanding this and on humbling yourself before God, your words were heard. And I have come in response to your words. Verse 13, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia was withstanding me for 21 days. Therefore, this prince, that speaking to Daniel was blocked in giving the message by this other type of prince that is called the Prince of Persia. This is a satanic counterfeit. This is part of Satan's, you know, uh, divine counsel. And he says, behold, Michael, one of the chief priests came to help me for I had been left there with the kings of Persia. So what we see here is that um, th th that uh, so th if Michael helps free this one so that he can deliver the message. The Lord's 70 spiritual princes are opposed by Satan's evil 70 spiritual princes. This is echoed also in the New Testament. I'm going to turn to Ephesians chapter 6. You've read it before. Okay, but let's remind ourselves what it really says. And it's verse 12, very famous verse of Ephesians 6. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, that is just human things. But ultimately, Paul's saying, but it's against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. What he's saying there, the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places, the Greek word is cosmokrator. And cosmokrator means a lord or a prince of this age over the nations. That's in the Greek what it means. So Paul is telling us again in the New Testament there is this hierarchy of these beings, okay? That is a satanic hierarchy, mm -hmm. almost like an army with its commanders that do things at different levels. And at the top level are these fallen angels who are head of nations and they work on and corrupt and direct the history and the actions of these nations. If this were not so, how do you think in the book of Revelation, 
that all of the nations would line up against Messiah. I mean, you have to be insane to line up against Messiah. Right. But they do. Every single one of them, he accumulates in this place called the Valley of Megiddo. Mm -hmm. And they all are out of their minds by somehow thinking that they're going to defeat him. He comes with a great sword. And he comes with this from Basra in this robe dipped in blood in red. And what does he do? They try to oppose him and he slaughters them. Up to the horses. Slaughters them during a 200 mile trek all the way from Basra, that is Petra, all the way to the valley of Megiddo. They are inspired by these satanic entities that have whipped them up into a furor that they will even try to oppose the Messiah. Okay? It's not by their own terms that they do it, they're inspired demonic satanically to do so. It's mentioned in many places in the Bible. It is. Yeah, but what are they doing today? They're they're opposing God. Absolutely. That's just what Paul's saying. They're doing it right now. Okay? So the things that you see going on in the world, you can look at politically, but ultimately, it's beyond politics. Oh, yeah. Okay? It's the satanic strategies of these fallen angelic beings that are influencing the leaders and the decision makers of these nations and getting them to do what these satanic entities and ultimately Satan wants them to do. So to think that they're acting on their own accord and it's their own idea, not so. They're doing the will of him who is the God of this world, as Paul tells us. Yes, Jack. Is that what we're seeing today in, the, in our government trying to uh, mix the, the sexes up and changes all the yes. sexes? So if it's against God's plan as a man and a woman, uh, part of this whole mentality, and no one sees it. The government isn't seeing them all with it. Correct, because they're blinded. Yeah. They're blinded satanically. They have given themselves over to satanic delusion by rejecting the Judeo-Christian foundation that this country had. And after they've rejected it sufficiently, he gives them over to this depraved mind where they do these things and see them as fine, see them as good, see them as correct, <clears throat> endorse them, absolutely. And it's only those who have spiritual eyes, the church, that can see the delusion and oppose it. Therefore, who are we from their standpoint? The We're the people that get right, the enemy. We're the people that get in the way. That's who we are. So this is why, you know, it says there will be indeed tribulation. Now, these fallen, quote, sons of God are also <laughs> called the demigods. And of course, <coughs> their ultimate number one desire is to be worshipped. And how is it that they want to be worshipped? They want to be worshipped through idols that use blood sacrifices. And you'll find in every culture, this is exactly the tr it's exactly the same way. Different names for the demigods, different names for the idols, but what do they all want? Blood sacrifices. Okay, so whatever the names are, in every nation, it doesn't matter because they all they all are they all driven by these demigods. Now let's go back to Deuteronomy 32 and let's read verses 9 through 14. So he says, For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the allotment of his inheritance. He found him in desert land in the howling waste of wilderness. He encircled him, he cared for him, he guarded him as the pupil of his eye. Like an eagle that stirs up its nest, that hovers over its young, he spreads his wings and he caught them. Remember that word, and he caught them. Mm -hmm. He carried them in his pinions. He says, the Lord alone guided him and there was no foreign God with him. He made him ride on the high places of the earth. 
He ate the produce of the field. He made him suck honey from the rock and oil from the flinty rock, curds of cows and milk of the flock with fat with the fat of lambs and rams, the, the breed of Bashan and goats with the finest of wheat and of the blood of the grapes, uh, you drank wine. So let's go through this. Is Jacob here symbolizing all of Israel? Yes, yes. So he's saying that God took originally, of course, Abraham, the grandfather of Jacob, found him in this desert land, okay? Put his focus on him, moved him, directed him, and created out of him a people, correct? So he protected and he led Israel. Israel is unique because think about what he just said in verse 9 for the lord's portion is his people even though all these other nations had an assigned angelic leader behind them god was the one that leads israel himself he is israel's portion or israel is his portion that's interesting this this phrase you'll see it in um I'm sorry, let me find it. So back here, I gotta turn back. He says he guarded him as the pupil of his eye. Now, this is a very interesting phrase. Uh, in the Hebrew, uh, it is a little bit different in what it's saying. In the Hebrew grammar, it really means the reflection of who he gazes at. That's what the Hebrew means, the reflection of whom he gazes at. Now, it's interesting. You should try this sometime. You can do it in a mirror, or you can do it by looking at the other, your spouse, for instance. If you look very closely at another person's eye, and you look at the very center of the middle of their eye, very closely, very, very close to them, what you will see is what? A ref no, a reflection of yourself they are looking at you and they see the gaze of you in the in the hebrew it was called the little man inside very very close you saw the little man the object of the one who's that he's looking at so that's what he means by the pupil of his eye it's a very intimate phrase because you have to get very very close to this person that you're looking at to see this all right this is how intimate God is in terms of his love and care for Israel. Now, another image that's very interesting is this image about the eagle and the eaglet. Do you see it? It says that, <clears throat> I see it starts, an eagle that stirs up its nest, that hovers over its young, and he spread his wings and caught them. He carried them on his pinions. He guided them. Now, it's interesting. There's a man who was a famous ornithologist in the early 1900s. His name was Arthur C Cleveland Bent, A.C. Bent. And he studied eagles and eaglets. And he would go around and watch these nests for hours and hours. And what he saw is that at a point in time after these eaglets had a fair number of, of feathers, the mother would go to the nest, pick up the eaglet, and throw it out. And he estimated that the eaglet would fall as much as 100 to 150 feet. And then the mother would swoop down and catch the eaglet on her back. And then she would go back to the nest, put the eaglet back, pick up another eaglet, drop it down this sheer face cliff, another 100 or 150 feet, and catch it and bring it back to the nest. And he, she would do this over and over and over until one day, finally, the eagle got the idea, I better fly <laughs> and start to flap its wings. And that's how the eagle learned to fly. <clears throat> this is how they do it. And this is how God does it. Now, to me, this is a great definition of faith. It's when you step out and it looks like nothing's there. And it looks like you're going to fall, but there's a promise there. I'll catch you. 
Okay. This is like God's. Like motherhood today. I'm sorry. Like motherhood today. Yeah. Same thing. Right. Toss them out. Right. And then you catch them. Right. So this is a great image of faith. <laughs> now, <clears throat> verses 12 through 14 shows the way that the Lord provided for Israel. It, it goes to this list. He provided them crops and produce and honey and milk and flocks and wheat and wine. But, of course, they weren't in any way thankful for any of the things he provided them, even though he provided all of them. Matter of fact, they, they were worse than that. They became complacent, okay? And, of course, later on, what do they do? They turn to the demigods and claim that the demigods were the ones that provided all this for them. Now, this is the epitome of apostasy. Mm -hmm. What's the difference today? Well, it, it is, I think, same for many, many people. There's an interesting verse. If you want to turn just after Daniel, if you want to turn to Hosea, Hosea says a very interesting thing. It's in Hosea 13. And it is verses 4 through 6. It, it really conveys this idea. Yet, I have been the Lord your God since the land of Egypt, and you were not to know any God except me, for there is no Savior besides me. I cared for you in the wilderness, in the land of drought. As they had their pasture, they became satisfied. And being satisfied, their heart became proud. Therefore, they forgot me. So I will be like a lion to them, and like a leopard, I will lie in wait by their side. I will encounter them like a bear robbed of her cubs. In other words, he's going to punish Israel for the repeated turning to the idols, to idolatry. So, in verse, let's read now verses 15 through 18 of chapter 32. He says, but Jeshurun, it's hard for me to pronounce, Jeshurun, Jeshurun, grew fat and kicked. You are grown fat and thick and sleek. Then he who forsook God who made him and scorned the rock of salvation. Verse 16, they made him jealous with the strange gods, with abominations they provoked him to anger. They sacrificed demons who were not God to, to gods that they have not known, new gods who came lately, whom your fathers did not dread. You neglected the rock who begot you and forgot the God who gave you birth. So he says, he calls this, he calls Israel this unique name, Jeshurun, okay? Jeshurun. And it's a very ironic name. He says it purposely for irony, because what it means is the upright one. And they are anything but the upright one. They become complacent in their blessings. They take for granted the Lord. And of course, worst of all, as I said, they attribute their blessings to the demigods, to the, quote, strange gods. They scorned the rock of salvation, okay? Literally, the rock of salvation, the Hebrew translation of that is the rock of Yahweh, literally, the rock of Yahweh. Uh, and their prophetic final salvation, of course, interesting, will be that rock. That is Messiah, the rock of Yahweh. They also, of course, spurned uh his first advent when he came to earth and rejected him again. Now, verse 16 says they did, quote, abominations. The word there in Hebrew is tu elah. It means toying with something unclean or toying with something that's an improper mixture. Remember back in chapter 22, we went all through these improper mixtures. Mm -hmm. And God said there were certain things that should never mix with other things. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's this same concept again. They are mixing the things of the Lord with the things of the demigods or the demons. That's what he's talking about, which involve 
of course, in terms of behavior, sexual de deviations, immoral behavior, and immoral practices, etc. Now, in verse 17, it says that they sacrifice to the demons. In the Hebrew, this is the word sheed, S-H-E-D. And it means an interesting thing. It means the spirits of the dead. Okay, the spirits of the dead. That is, the demons mimic dead people. And therefore, this is why they turn to mediumship and channeling practices. Okay, because they consulted with mediums who allegedly talked to the dead so they could get question answer, questions answered. But God says clearly they're not talking to the dead. They're talking to demons that mimic the dead. Okay, remember, anything the demon is going to say in a mediumistic seance is going to be a lie. Okay, it's going to be spiritual disinformation, guaranteed. And that's why God forbid them to do it. Except in the case of Saul. Well, except in the case of Saul, where God intervened specially in that case. Although he condem God condemned Saul for seeking the medium, right? Because he was absolutely forbidden, but then decided to use the medium to tell him that <laughs> his days were over. Okay. It's super popular. Oh, it is. Like, it is. I, for centuries. It is well for centuries, and it's getting much more popular. Well, now they advertise on TV. Oh yeah. yeah. It's, Call this number. Psyche. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, uh, and it's always been, but it's becoming more so because as people reject God in his truth, what becomes the alternative information source? That's not necessarily true because people don't hear God. They don't go to church and they don't have it taught to them. Well, so they're, they're going to an area where it's easy to find and they get some kind of a solution. I agree, but they're, but they're avoiding the, the source of truth because they're not going to church, they're not coming to Bible study, they're not hearing the Word of God, they're not understanding His teachings, so as they reject that, then they turn to an alter, alternate source. You know, one of the worst examples, quote-unquote, but biggest examples of this trend in America was in the 1840s, which was the beginning of what's called the spiritualist movement started with these two women called the Fox Sisters, who claimed in this house they lived in that they would have knockings that would indicate information from the, the souls of dead people. And they developed this into a huge, huge organization, which ended up developing 13 different auditoriums around the United States where they would hold conferences to teach people how to consult with the dead, with the dead. It's a spiritualist church. Exactly. Ashford. And there's one and an old auditorium also, right. one of the 13 in Ashley, yeah. Ohio. Yeah. And if you go to the spiritualist church, which is called Lily, Val Lily Chapel, yeah. Lily Chapel, which is in Ashley, if you go any Sunday or Wednesday, they will offer you to meet with one of their mediums so that you can ask questions about one of your dead relatives. Mm -hmm. Happens yeah. every week there. And they're deceiving people because on Wednesday night they have a big meal and you can go in for right. little money. In other words, and that's what they use to survive, you know, on those meals. But they're, it's deception all the way. It is. And it's spiritual misinformation. They're learning things that are not true because they're seeking them from the wrong source. He also says that they, uh, uh, he talks about this non-gods. Do you see it in that verse? It, the word in Hebrew is lo Elohim. It means the things that one attributes to, to God-like powers, but is not a God. Okay? I think we're seeing this all the time. How many, notice that the, the uh, climate change concept Oh. And the need to quote unquote save the earth, what do these new age people worship? Gaia, quote unquote, Mother Earth. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, they appeal to Gaia. They, 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 they worship Gaia. They have all of these you know, ceremonies around Gaia worship because 
this has become their uh, non-god who they've made into a god. Now it also says uh, that uh, they they talk about, it says also the new gods, that is the gods who have come lately. This is a reference to the Canaanite gods. They're gonna go into Canaan in just a very short period of time, and they're gonna be introduced to Canaanite gods, which will also spread more disinformation to them if they pay attention to them, which unfortunately they do. Now, let's read the last verses that we're gonna to cover tonight, and it's verses 18 through 22. He says, you neglected the rock who begot you, and you forgot the God who gave you birth. And the Lord saw this and spurned them because of the provocation of his sons and daughters. Then he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see uh, what is their end, what is, I will see what their end shall be, for they are a perverse generation, sons in whom there is no faithfulness. They have made me jealous with what is not God, that is, quote unquote, the demigods. And they have provoked me with their idols. So I, I will make them jealous with those who are not a people. And I'll provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. For a fire is kindled in anger, and it burns to the lowest part of Sheol, and it consumes the earth with its yield and it sets on fire the foundations of the mountains. What's going on in California? <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe it's the physical manifestation of what's going on spiritually. So let's go through this. Again, it says they neglected the rock, their father, the foundation, their creator. The Lord, as a result, it says, hides his face. The Hebrew word there is uh, HaKodesh. HaKodesh literally means the Holy Spirit. So he hides the Holy Spirit from them. Thus he withdraws his protection. He withdraws giving them direction. He withdraws any blessings. And he says basically to them, let's see how this works out for you. Let's see how this goes since you've rejected me. Now, I think this is certainly a great analogy to, again, what's going on in our culture. This culture has almost completely rejected the Judeo-Christian foundation which it was set upon. What do we see as a result now that it's rejected it, and there's very little of the Judeo-Christian ethic anymore? We see the highest murder rates that we've ever seen going on in large cities. We see lawlessness going on like we've never seen before. We see racial conflict going on in this nation. We see terrible division. We see terrible confusion. We see people who act aimlessly. And we see a culture moving in a virtual death march. You know, Ezekiel 14, 12, I won't go there. I've gone to it many times. He says, but any nation who, who goes against me, I will do the following. And he talks about the step wise progression of of uh curses that he will uh, uh put on that nation in that case in ezekiel 14 12 he's not talking about israel he's talking about the goyim any nation who does this therefore we are easily included in that process now in verse 21 it's a hebrew wordplay and what he says and i'll i'll i'll, I'll try to to put it in English the way the Hebrew puts it. Since you provoke me by a non-God, uh, non I will provoke you by non-people. That's literally in the Hebrew what he says. The non-people, Hebrew, lo ami. The people not of me, the goyim. That's what he's talking about. Now, it's interesting. By about, now think of what he's saying here. He says, because you've done all these things, you're going to end up being turned over to the nations, the Goyim, and they're going to punish you. You, know, you get the principle here, okay? Now, we see that around 800 BC, this starts in a major way. During that time, 
there's a prophet. His name is Hosea. And he prophesies of the coming invasion which will come into the northern part of Israel. That nation will be Assyria. And to illustrate this, he says for uh, 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 Hosea to do something very strange. Let's turn to the book of Hosea, just after Daniel. Go to Daniel and go one more. And it comes to Hosea. Hosea is going to illustrate the problem. Verse 2, chapter 1, verse 2. When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, uh, he's a prophet of God, remember, supposedly showing in his character and in his behavior the elements of God. He says, go take to yourself a wife of harlotry and have children of harlotry, for the land commits flagrant harlotry, forsaking the Lord. So he went and he took Gomer, the daughter of Diblaim, and she conceived and bore him a son. And then he goes through these three sons that he has. And God tells him how to name them. The first son, okay, is named Yisrael, that is, God causes. That's what it means in the Hebrew, God causes. The second son is named Lo or Maya, and it means to have no pity or to have no mercy. And then he has this third son named Lo Ami, which means not my people. So put them together. What's God saying through Hosea in the birth of his sons? That God's going to cause no pity or mercy to occur to these individuals that act like they're not his people anymore. These three sons are prophetic of what God's going to do. And of course, the Assyrian army comes in and does exactly that. They invade and they take part of the Jewish people in the north away and spread them out into a not my people area, the Goyim, the nations. And then they bring in people who are not my people, the Goyim, and deposit them in the northern part of Israel. That part of Israel was called Samaria. They were a admixture between Jews and Gentiles. And they also practiced a syncretistic religion, which was not truly Judaism, although it had certain elements of Judaism. And they were dis despised by the Jews. And they were despised by the Jews. So this is the literal fulfillment of this prophecy. Now back to, back to our text. And we'll finish up here for tonight in Deuteronomy 32. In verse 22, he says, For a, a fire is kindled in my anger. Now notice where the fire is kindled. Think about this. He's not saying it's kindled on the surface of the land. He says, A fire is kindled in my anger and burns to the lowest parts of Sheol and consumes the earth with its yield and sets on fire the foundations of the mountains. Now, you go, what the heck is he talking about? Well, let's go through it. Moses states that those who turn from Yahweh, when they die, die will go to a fiery place called Sheol, a place of torment, a place of demons. Remember this famous story uh, in Luke 16, where Jesus describes that Sheol has two parts. One part is the part of the people who are faithful, that are believers. And in that part, it's called Abraham's bosom, he calls it. And in that part, they have comfort. But there's another side, right, that this man ends up going to. This man that had a good life on the earth, but wasn't a believer. Paradise. Right, and he ends up going to this place where there's torment. And in this side called Sheol, the unsaved side. And of course, 
in that place, one is never satisfied. Now remember, he asked this poor man Lazarus to dip with his finger in water to put on the very tip of his tongue to comfort him. It's a place of no comfort. It's where people long to communicate but can't. What does he say to this Lazarus? Okay, and I'm sorry, to Abraham. He says, please let me communicate with my brothers who are still alive. Okay, let me just talk with them. And what does Abraham, what does God say there? No. If you didn't listen to Moses, you're not going to listen to them. Exactly. If you're not going to listen to Moses and the prophets, then you're not going to listen if I send someone back. Now, I want you to turn to finish off to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 5. We're going to read verse 10. This is the, the account of the Gerasene demoniac. Remember, mm -hmm. this man who, when Jesus confronts him about the demons within him, he says, we are legion, mm -hmm. thousands, yeah. legion. It's a term of the military Roman army. Mm -hmm. And, of course, he goes there and he finds this man, verse 4, he was bound by shackles and chains, and the chains had been torn apart by him, and the shackles broken into pieces, and no one was strong enough to subdue him. He had almost supernatural strength. And constantly, night and day, among the tombs and in the mountains, he was crying out and gnashing himself with stones. That is, trying to inflict damage to himself. We find that de demonized people truly have a demon, do exactly all these things. They speak and they have incredible strength. They speak in strange languages, languages in which they can't know, and they cut themselves frequently, and of course have intensely suicidal ideas. The demon is trying to kill them, get them to kill themselves. Verse six, and Jesus seeing him from a distance, ran up and, and this man bowed down before Jesus crying out with a loud voice, and notice what he says. It's the demon speaking here. He says, what do I have to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? I implore you, by God, do not torment me. And we're going to figure out very quickly in the next couple of verses what that torment means. The torment he's talking about is being sent back to Sheol. Okay, they don't want to go back there. Where do they want to go? To another person. Well, another yes, person. but they don't get the chance to do that. So as a second option, then what do they ask Jesus to do? To the pigs. Bucket. Right. To send him into the swine, mm -hmm. the flock of pigs, so that they can at least stay in some form of a body on the earth, so they don't have to go back to Sheol. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, now, in verse 10, of course, in verse 9, Jesus says, what's your name? And he says, Legion, for we're many. In verse 10, he says, and he began to entreat him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Not to send them out of the country. The word there in the Greek is kora, C-H-O-R-A. And it means, literally, a region of space lying between two places. Think about that. What is Sheol? It's in between. It's in between earth mm -hmm. and heaven. It's not earth and it's not heaven. Mm -hmm. It's this region in, be in between where these dead go, these dead souls go, called Sheol. Now, and it's where, interesting. And, and where do they stay till Jesus comes? Exactly. We're going to talk about that. Turn, if you would, to Isaiah chapter 34. Isaiah says a very interesting thing about this. Isaiah says a lot of interesting things. If you want to learn a lot about dead things and demons, Isaiah tells you an incredible amount about them if you study it. Chapter. I, 34. And I want you, we're going to read verses 9 through 11. Now, he's describing this place 
Notice how he describes it. And its stream shall be turned into pitch. What is pitch? Tar. tar. It's a tar that's so hot it goes on fire. Okay. And it's loose earth into brimstone. What's brimstone? Burning material. Okay. Lava. Yeah, like lava. And its land shall become burning pitch. Again, like lava. And it shall not be quenched day or night. In other words, there's no way to escape it. And there's no way to escape the torment of it. Its smoke shall go up forever. From generation to generation, it shall be, notice this word, desolate. That word, desolation, is the greatest single adjective that he describes about this place of Sheol. None shall pass through it forever and ever. In other words, once you got in it, you're not going to get out of it. Okay, there's no passing through it. There's no exit in it. And then he goes on, and I'm not going to talk about this very much, but he says the pelican and the hedgehog shall possess it. Let me assure you that it's not re referring to an animal called a pelican or an animal called a hedgehog. If you look at the Hebrew, it's the, na it's the name of different, two different types of demons is what he's talking about there. And it, same thing when he talks about the owl and the raven. They shall dwell in it. And he shall strip. Now, here's the key. I want you to understand this verse. And he shall stretch over it the line of desolation and the plumb line of emptiness. In other words, this is a place of burning heat and fire. It is endless. There's no end to it. It is eternal. It is a place of complete desolation. See, the line of desolation. The plumb line of emptiness. In other words, there is no plumb line. The plumb line was used as an architect to design something, but it doesn't have an architect that will design anything in it. Okay? It's desolate. It's a region of meaninglessness, of despair, of darkness. It's a place of chaos. Interestingly enough, the same word there is found in Genesis 1-2. It says, God hovered over the waters because they were void. It's the word literally that means chaos because it's this mass that hadn't been turned into anything. And God hadn't used it yet to create. He will as the days go through, but not yet at this point. In other words, it's untouched by any of God's creative processes or any of God's organization. It's a place that is completely void of God. That's the key. It's almost something that we can't imagine what Sheol will be like. Separation from God. In the most complete and total sense. Because we always have related to the creation of God. Mm -hmm. So it, we've never related to something that's not the creation of God. But Sheol, which will end up being hell eventually, will be this place. It will be so desolate that there isn't anything about God that will exist in it. And those who are cast in it will live that way for eternity. Notice, go to Revelation 20 to finish this out. This should motivate us about the gospel. Because we should make want to make certain that in every way we can, we don't want anyone to go there. Because it's going to be the most heinous place that a person could ever exist. Start in verse 10 of Revelation 20. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone, same images, where the beast and the false prophet are also. And they shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, whose presence earth and heaven fled away and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead. These are the souls that are unsaved. The great and the small, standing before the throne, 
and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which was the book of life. And the dead were judged by the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. In other words, they're judged by the book of deeds, not by the book of life. Because when you're saved, your name goes permanently in the book of life. Therefore, the only way that God think of, can think of you is being in his kingdom that is filled with his life. And it says the sea gave up the dead. He's talking about the bodies of these dead, okay, which were in it. And death and Hades, here's the Greek word for Sheol, okay, gave up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. And death and Hades, that is the Greek word Sheol, were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the place that we call hell. It is this permanent place where we can almost, we almost can't imagine how hideous and desolate this place will be for those that reject the salvation that the Savior gave to them. Jack. Okay, so you're saying this is something that's interesting to me. The book of deeds would be, would be classified as people who have never had a chance to learn about Christ. No. So they will be they will be judged on on their on their character on no, their deeds. It's not those who have never heard of Christ. It's, it's, it's those it's those who have heard of Christ and rejected it, and they reject the salvation of grace. So what are they going on? Their own deeds. Well, people about talk about people that. In other countries who have never had a chance to hear about Jesus. Well, what happens? I well, Paul. Paul deals with that in Romans chapter two. Mm -hmm. He says, you're only, not, you're only judged by that in which you sh you've shown. So if they've never been shown the gospel, right. then they're not judged by that, it at that level. That's what he says in Romans two. But the point is, people that reject the gospel of Christ, what do they always say to themselves? Mm -hmm. I'm not worried about it because I feel like I'm a pretty good person. Good person. Right. The book of deeds. Right. I'm good enough. I've done these good things. How many people have said, oh, you know, I'll just shake hands with all my friends up there? Yes. Yeah. I mean, how gross. Absolutely. Now, I want to finish tonight with a quote from Jeremiah 4. A few verses. Then I'm going to read it to you. It's going to, we're going to start in... Okay. Up and just turn to Ezekiel. <laughs> I've got to go back to Jeremiah right after Isaiah. Jeremiah 4. Then we're going to start in verse 23. Here's Jeremiah's version of this. I looked at the earth, and behold, it was formless and void. Think about that. There's only one at a time that the earth was formless and void. In the beginning. Or God, before he takes this huge ball of water and turns it into his whole creation, okay? But he says, I'm looking now at the earth, and behold, it is now formless and void. And to the heavens, and they had no light. And I looked on the mountains, and behold, they were quaking, and all the hills moved to and fro. And I looked, and behold, there was no man, and all the birds of the heavens had fled. And I looked, and behold, the fruitful land was wilderness, and all its cities were pulled down before the Lord, before his fierce anger. For thus says the Lord, the whole land shall be, here's the word again, desolation. Yet I will not execute a complete destruction, for this, and he goes on and talks about the earth, but he's talking about the end of days. That is, he's going to perform another form of desolation. Anything that is not life in God is desolation. And, and I think we should be moved by this in terms of 
talking to those that don't know him. We don't want them to live eternity in this desolation. It's, it's, it's almost unimaginably horrid. So, okay, I talked a long time tonight, but you know, there's a lot in this, in this song, isn't it? And we're only part way through it. <laughs> but we'll finish it off next week. So um, let me close us in prayer, okay? Right. Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you for your word as always. Thank you for giving us so much information that you pack into your scripture. Thank you for the Holy Spirit who is able to enlighten us and teach us and show us these things that otherwise we would have no idea they existed, would have no explanation for them. So we thank you for all these things, and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.